This is In the Trenches, Broadcast 36. Welcome to In the Trenches, where entrepreneurs, artists, writers, designers, inventors, warriors, and leaders share their stories of doing the hard, creative work that impacts all of our lives. Let the journey inspire you to do something worthwhile, build something bold, and create your life's work. And now, your host, Tom Morgus. Welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. Today's guest is Rachel Glick, founder of Amor del Diablo, a Mexico-based Mizco company, which I'm, I might have just butchered the pronunciation. How did I do, Rachel? Well, most people here say Mezcal. Mezcal. Okay, I, I'm going to keep working on it. I have to work on <laughs> no. my pronunciation. But anyway, I'm really excited to have Rachel on here because I think what she's doing is, well, it's unique. I don't, I can't think of anybody else trying to build a company, um, you know, and, and do it import or export to the U.S. So this is, this is the first, I think, also for first person on the show doing something like this. So Rachel, thanks so much for being on the show with us today. It's a pleasure. So let's get right to it. Tell, tell everyone a little bit about yourself and, and then also um, how you got into building Amor Del Diablo. Uh, well, it all kind of happened by uh, a bunch of different circumstantial events. i from the U.S. and I moved to uh, Mexico, to Zihuatanejo in 2012. Um, without any real plan, but then I met my now husband, and through a turn of events, we ended up in Baja, California, but um, let's see, last year we went south to Chiapas to uh, buy textiles and things that we wanted to sell in the market in Baja, and we stopped in Oaxaca, and I went to visit a friend of mine that I had known from Nepal, and he'd been working with a family of mezcaleros for five years on and off. So he gave us a tour of the Palenque, which is basically the where the mezcal is distilled. And through a couple hours of conversation, uh, the family ended up giving us 10 liters of mezcal and said, hey, you know, go sell this. Maybe we can start something. And it kind of, we returned to Baja and it just sat in our house and, well, we, <laughs> we drank a lot of it. <laughs> and then we kind of started to sell it and we're like, oh, hey, alcohol sells really well. We should probably do something with this. And, uh, yeah, so we've just kind of been working word of mouth, like testing the market, selling to friends and that sort of thing. And now we are currently in Oaxaca researching all the bits that we need to do to officially launch this. Awesome. So tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, when you first started off, uh, that, that first piece right there where you started essentially testing it in the marketplace, um, and, and selling to your friends. So after you guys obviously enjoyed it yourselves, but tell me about the response there. Like, did you do it in a kind of calculated way, or were you just kind of, you know, I don't know, going um, casually? See it? Everything about this has been very organic. Uh, we, you know, we sold some bottles to some friends that know what mezcal is and like it, and then you know they would tell some other friends who would come, and then Noel, my husband, started doing casual tastings at our house, and he did a couple at some other people's house, and he would prepare a little bit of food because mezcal is supposed to be really taken with food. It's more of a digestive. Um, and, you know, he'd talk a lot about the history of mezcal and what's going on with mezcal and that sort of thing. And so gradually some more people would find out. And then uh, we worked with a mezcaleria in La Paz, and he gave a couple different tastings there which there was an amazing response to. I mean, the, the place completely filled up and yeah, so that was great. And we knew we had a great product and, you know, Noel, my husband says that there's, there's two things in this world that are, that always sell. One is religion and the other is vices of which alcohol be included. So yeah, sure. And I guess it helps out to some extent too. Um, curious. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm curious about this. This is really cool. So, had you have, like, what's your background? Have you do you have any background in anything that really might pertain to this at all in terms of like I don't know business or import export anything like that? No, uh, not really. I, jeez, I mean, I studied like biology and wildlife conservation in university. Um, I've done lots of little things as far as starting my own business, such as um, 
you know, like, well, I've built a couple of my own websites. Uh, one is my blog site. The other is the Immortal, Immortal Diablo website. Um, I've never done anything with export, no. Um, my husband has, I mean, he's Mexican, and Mezcal is a big part of his life growing up and, you know, and through adulthood, and so he knows a lot about it. And his father and his grandfather both made and sold Mezcal, um, but he's never done any export. So, yeah. It's, it's an interesting process. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that, yeah, the, the, the drink itself. I really, ignorantly, I don't know if I've ever had it. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit about the drink, and then tell me about how it's made, uh, you know, in terms of, like, the, the, I don't know, the farming process or, or whatever you have to go through. And then are you guys doing the farming process yourselves, or are you getting it from local growers? Right. Um, yeah, no, there's a lot of people that don't know about mezcal. It is becoming a really big thing in the U.S., but it's still, you know, you find it more in cities and people that are really into the cocktail culture and that kind of thing. Um, mezcal is an agave-based spirit, as is tequila. Uh, tequila, however, tequila is actually a mezcal. It's a type of mezcal, but tequila can only be made from the Blue Weber agave and only made in certain regions, whereas mezcal is made from 39 or more different uh, species and even more varieties of agave. Um, the other thing is tequila has become very industrialized, uh, whereas mezcal by and large is still very artisanal and traditional. There certainly are companies that have industrialized it, but there's still a lot of people making it the way they've made it for hundreds of years. Um, so, and the way that's done is there, there are several cultivated species and there are others that are wild. So, uh, when the, just before the plant hits maturity, they harvest it, they cut off the leaves, they take what's called the piña, because it looks like a pineapple, and they put it in an underground oven, roast it for a week or two, and then they take it out, they chop it up, either by hand or with a horse drawing a big stone wheel, traditionally, and then they put that in a big vat with water, and it just ferments naturally with yeast from the air for about a week or two, and then they put it through a copper or a clay alembic to distill it. And the result is, what's really cool about mezcal is every batch is different. Even if you use the same type of agave and the same process, it all comes out a little bit different because there's so many different factors that go into it. Um, so it's, it's really a fascinating drink. And uh, if it's made artisanally, it's 100% organic and totally pure. There's no added sugars. There's no added chemicals. And this is, I was happy to find, is an alcohol that I can drink without getting a hangover or a headache, which is rare for me. I usually get headaches really easily when I drink alcohol. Yeah, it sounds a little so. magical. Um, it, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. So it, tell me now about, let's switch over. So, good, and by the way, very good information. I, I'm, I actually learned a lot just from that. So I'm actually excited <laughs> to go try some yeah, soon, um, probably right after this call. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, but tell me a little <laughs> bit about the process that you went through when it came to exporting of this product um you know what do you what do you do you know, i mean just well, and, and i think that's interesting for anybody who might be interested in um exporting or importing something well we're not we haven't yet exported it um we're in the process right now of figuring out the you know all the legal details to be able to export it so mexico has its own laws and regulations and things you have to fulfill and it's alcohol, so it's it's costly. You know, I mean, there's a lot high taxes on it and all kinds of regulations. So it's not like you're if you're exporting artesania or something. It's it's much more complicated. So we're still researching that, and then we're going to put together a business plan and look for an investor. Um, so that's what we're doing in Oaxaca because Oaxaca is like the hub of mezcal. Um, so. I don't know if I've answered your question or. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, that's been interesting. So, and that's what I was kind of curious about: is is this something that you would need an investor for, or is it something you could you could? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, right now we're we're working organically. Like, you know, the for, the good thing about starting a business in Mexico is the laws are all a little gray here. So, you know, we've been selling word of mouth, and I think there's ways of selling in the market that you know. There's ways of doing business here on a small scale to kind of start building up the finances, but, um, you know, ultimately to fit all the regulations that you need to with alcohol, it's going to be, we're going to need an investor. So, and, and there's, you know, the set of rules for Mexico and then there's the set of rules for the United States and the way it works, my understanding with alcohol 
in the U.S. is it's a state by state thing. So, you know, there's there's a lot of work yet to be done, but this the beginning stage is very exciting because we can make some money as well as we're growing. Right. No, it's very interesting. So, on that, and again, if you know, as I know you're still researching this stuff, but I'm I really am curious about this. You know, where do you start when you when you you have this idea for something like where where do you actually start like when it comes to the research or who who do you start engaging with and 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 in in particular when it comes to building the business plan like what do you how do you or like like where do you start to actually like put that together? <laughs> well we have um uh so there's a regulating commission of mescal that puts their official mark on your bottle that says that okay you can call this mescal and sell it and so we're in Oaxaca researching what we need to do for them. And um, basically, they give you the information of the costs and the steps. So we have that we're putting together. But we're also, we've been talking with people that are selling Mescal themselves, either as a brand that are they're exporting themselves, or some people in Mexico have their own bars and have been selling. Um, they basically take very artisanal Mescal, put it in a bottle, put their own label on it, and it's not registered, but they manage through whatever you know uh technique to sell it within their bar so we're talking to people in the industry basically um and as well as some of the mezcaleros which are the people that make mezcal um we've spoken with a few of them so it's kind of just it's really a step-by-step thing you know you move about it organically and that's also a thing about work in mexico is it's not the way you go about things in the United States, things in the U.S. are usually much more clear. Here's your set of rules. This is what you have to do. You have to get your money. Da, 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 da. Whereas in Mexico, it's a lot of kind of, I don't know, it seems like more of a dance to me. Mm. So are you nervous at all about, you know, something like this in the context of because you're a small operation, you're still working on so many things from the ground level and still like researching that a bigger organization or a bigger company could come in and, um, essentially disrupt what you're doing? Um, not really, because there's already, I mean, there's already a number of mezcal companies. And the thing is with artisanal mezcal is that there are so many mezcaleros, there's so many people producing mezcal, as they have been for hundreds of years, and they produce, you know, small batches. Um, so it's, it's still very much a growing market. So, I mean, there's going to be other companies come and start their product, but there's a lot of room for growth. So it's not, no, I'm not really concerned about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And as far as this process is concerned, um, I, again, I'm just purely curious about this. Um, are you going to, like, do you have to, like, connect with distributors as well? Um, you know, things like that. Like, what, what is that like? Once you start to get into that, what are the things that you have to do? Or is it just kind of like, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to do that? Yeah, that's something I've started to, or I've been kind of, Talking about with friends in the U.S., I have some friends that work um, in San Francisco. One has just recently begun his own distribution company, mostly focusing on wines. And so I've talked to him, and he said there are there are techniques for bringing it in. It's normally it's very difficult to get a distribution company to represent your brand, but if you have connections with restaurants and things, it's possible to bring it in, sell it specifically to those restaurants. There are there are ways around that, and then once you build enough interest, you can, um, you know, then the, a distribution company takes interest in your mar- in your brand and begins to say, okay, yeah, we're interested in selling this. And uh, actually, last when was that? In July, I was passing through San Francisco, and I brought a few bottles with me and gave a tasting at a restaurant there, uh, which was great. I got a lot of interest, and I mean, there's a lot of people really interested in mezcal right now, so it's. That's also a bonus for us. It's, right. it's really okay. Um, I, I'm curious. What's right now? What like? What's the most difficult thing you're going through? Like, what's the greatest hurdle or the greatest struggle with doing something like this? Um, patience is a big one, which is something that I've never had a lot of. So, you know, patience to just all this stuff really does take time. Um, and then you know, a lot of it is, is money really. I mean, because it all, it is all coming together and it's all flowing. And in fact, when I think about where we were one year ago, one year ago today, we had no ideas of doing a mezcal company and already we've made, we've done a lot of work. So, um, you know, patience and money, really, uh, the money to continue and then how we're going to find an investor to, to make this really grow. 
Yeah. So what are your goals then in terms of, I guess, timeline wise? I know it, it's uh, basically what you're saying that like the way I understand it is that t- it moves at its own pace in Mexico for sure. But what are your, your goals in terms of like one to five years out? Like, or I suppose just one year out. Do you, do you expect that within the next year? Um, I would say that I don't, we don't have all the information I need that we need so far to make a really solid plan of what we can expect in one year and that sort of thing. But, um, I would hope that we are registered and, um, it's, it's kind of early to even say really how far we could be in one year, but I mean, I don't think we'll be exporting within one year. I think we'll need a little more time than that, but um, hopefully we'll be well on our way okay. to having things official in Mexico. What's the, uh, what's the scariest thing about the process of doing this? I mean, you know, we just talked about the, the struggles, but are you, are you nervous at all about going through this process and, and, and doing what you're doing? Um, uh, I suppose the one thing that has me a little nervous is there's a lot of politics when it comes to alcohol. Um, you know, especially if you're working on an artisanal brand, there's a lot of big name brands and there's a lot of regulations and there can be, there just to be a lot of like pettiness and pol- political stuff that I'm expecting will face at one point. Um, otherwise, yeah, it's a big change for me because, um, I've basically been a nomad for most of my life, just kind of taking odd jobs and that kind of thing. So now this is a lot of focus um, to really dive into one major project like this. So I don't know. It's just it's a, it's a lot of changes, but I wouldn't say I'm that nervous about it. <laughs> sure. Is this uh? And sorry, you might have might have mentioned this at least briefly, but. How much time does this take up for you? Is this, is this essentially full time for you? Basically, kind of doing a part time, or how does how does that work? Um, I wouldn't say it's full time yet. No, I've I've been you know it kind of, it kind of is in fits and spurts. So this summer I did a crowdfunding campaign to raise money for this trip that we're now on, and that that was full time. That I you know didn't realize how much work a crowdfunding campaign could be. Um, and as for now, like it's you know it. It's not, it doesn't take a ton of time to do the research. I mean, it takes time as far as like making the connections and that sort of thing, but it doesn't take up a lot of time on a daily basis. Um, I'm also keeping up a blog on our, our trip and the people we're meeting and the information we're finding out. And so there's, you know, like photo editing and writing about that. Um, and then when we go back to Baja this winter, we'll be, planning on giving tastings and parties and selling um, in the market. So that'll probably be not quite full time, maybe three quarters. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, but oh yeah. so, I, I have talked to others in the business that have their own own brand and it, for them, it's very much a full time job. Yeah. So, so. That's what you're, you're expecting now. That's what you're expecting to get. Yeah. So, How's your, how big is your audience right now, if at all? Um, I mean, it sounds like you're blogging, you've been blogging for a while, um, on, on various platforms, so you're, you're skilled in that, that aspect. You've been, you've been doing the online stuff for a bit. Um, as far as like kind of building a brand around what you're doing, uh, I'm, I, I'm sh- I know you're doing that right now. So how, you know, how big is your audience and, and how are you kind of like reaching, how do you reaching your target audience and how are you getting them to, uh, to, well, to pay attention basically to, to support you guys? Well, this is, um, <laughs> actually, it's probably been a bit of a struggle for me. Uh, the, the website, I've only just started a couple months ago and it really, I think things really kicked off when I did the tasting in San Francisco. Um, there was several write-ups about it. I wrote a couple blogs for a website called Nopalize, which is all about kind of sustainability and food and that sort of thing. Um, and it's a company that I had used to work for actually. I had originally founded that blog. It just kind of transformed into something, a different, its own kind of domain, but, um, years ago when I lived in San Francisco. So by publishing blogs on other websites, I've also published on uh, a blog called Mezcal, Mezcalistas, which is all about artisanal mezcal. And that's brought us a fair bit of attention. Um, and it's also, it helped us with our crowdfunding campaign. And I, I was also, it, brought the attention of the San Francisco Bay Guardian who called and did an interview with me um, for an article they put out 
about a month or two ago. And I, during my crowdfunding campaign, I also reached out to meetup groups that met up to, you know, do tequila or mezcal tastings or cocktail tastings or that kind of thing. Um, since then, my, the blog that I have is more of a like buy subscription. So I put a little blurb on the blog and then if people subscribe to the blog, then they get the newsletter, um, the full newsletter. And part of that was a, it was a reward for funders of our crowdfunding campaign. So. Um, I imagine in a couple months I'll be putting full blogs on our website yeah. for those who aren't subscribed. So yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> building a a an audience is I don't know is it, probably one of the biggest challenges for me. We've had a lot of positive response and a lot of interest, but even still, like really growing that has been hard. Yeah. I'd say. It's it's a uh, it's definitely that that type of industry that I don't necessarily I'm I'm, not, I'm also not tapped into it per se um, you know in terms of like alcohol related um, you know whether it's tequila mezcal or uh, you know beer or something like that you don't know, see many places necessarily like blogging about their stuff or at least I'm not tied into it so it'd be interesting to see how you, you might be able to leverage that in the future and build a platform um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious if you wouldn't mind you know, briefly discussing or, or talking about your, your Kickstarter campaign. What was it for? Or, and what, well, I don't even know if it was on Kickstarter. You said crowdfunding. So what platform was it on? What was it for? How much did you try to raise? Did you raise it? Something like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, we went with Rocket Hub, uh, partially because Kickstarter is an all or nothing scheme and I wanted to keep whatever we raised and Rocket Hub has that. Um, and also because Kickstarter has so many projects on it, I was afraid we might get a little lost. So I went with Rocket Hub and, um, we were trying to raise 5,500 US dollars. We didn't meet our goal, but we still did pretty well considering, um, we raised $3,100, I think. Um, and what were your other questions? <laughs> I forget. Those were the main ones. I, yeah, yeah, it was. It, I mean, it was it was a process, and actually, we, you know, what I've done is I'm continuing the crowdfunding from our website. I haven't really like put the effort into promoting it because we've been on the trip, busy with other things. But I have all the rewards still listed on our website, so as well as the video that explains our project. Um, and the crowdfunding was specifically for this trip to go and meet with mezcaleros and meet with, um, you know, other people in the industry, but to also gather all the information, all the numbers that we need to write out a business plan. So that that's our goal is to come away from this trip with a solid business plan. Oh, that's great. Well, Rachel, we're coming up on time here. I just want to say this is um, great discussion in my opinion. I, I learned a lot. I think it's really fascinating what you're doing. I'm excited for you. I'm excited to see what happens over the course of the next year or two. Um, and I definitely want Thanks. to stay in touch, but thank you so much for being on the show. And I want to hand it over to you real quick and ask you, where can people reach out to connect with you? Yeah, um, on our website, it's Amor del Diablo Mezcal.com. Um, and on that website, you'll see under about, you'll see the information, what we're all about. There's a video you can watch that talks about our goals. Um, there's the blog you can subscribe to, to get the newsletter. I send one out about once, maybe twice a week, um, with photos and everything. And there's also, if you go to the support us page, there's all the rewards that we offered for our crowdfunding that we're still offering for anybody that wants to support us. Really cool stuff. Every, anything from collector's edition bottles of mezcal to underwear that's kind of comical to a photo essay book of, um, mezcal culture. So yeah. Um, that would be great if anybody's interested. Go ahead and sign up. It's free. <laughs> and that wraps up another broadcast of In the Trenches. If you're interested in checking out the show notes, just head over to tomworkers.com slash podcast to see our latest episodes. Also, I just wanted to give a quick update to fans and listeners of In the Trenches and specifically what I'm working on right now. For the past two years, I've been publishing books, my own and others, through Insurgent Publishing, my boutique publishing company. In the past six months alone, I've helped four individual authors launch their books to bestseller on Amazon, including Dan Norris's The Seven Day Startup and David Nihil's Do You Talk Funny, among others. And both of those books are still top of the charts months after launch. I've learned two important things from all this. Number one, 
that people still read books. And believe it or not, they're willing to pay for the good ones. And number two, the $60 billion book industry is only getting bigger and the barrier to entry is only getting lower, which means access to this market has never been closer to the average writer, blogger, or author. It is literally within the grasp of anyone who wants it. But you need to know how to approach it the right way, with patience, with a strategy, and with the right implementation and execution. That's why I've been able to launch so many bestsellers, many that are still top of the charts, because we brought great books to the people who wanted and would pay for them. No slimy sales tactics, just honest, powerful marketing. Now, I want to show other authors and publishers how to do the same. Four months ago, I launched the pre-beta to a new super secret platform called Publishers Empire. In that time, I've helped a dozen authors and publishers start to bring their ideas to life. And with their help and feedback, we've quickly developed what is, in my opinion, the best, most comprehensive publishing training platform in the world. And now I'm getting ready to open the doors up to a few more students. So if you're interested in being part of a tight-knit family of publishers who help and support one another through their writing and publishing projects, if you want access to over 100 HD training videos to take you through the writing and publishing process, if you want access to proven copy and paste book marketing and sales copy, stuff that we've used to launch bestsellers, and if you'd like professional book covers and templates you could plug your own work into and look like a pro in minutes, and if you'd like all of that while getting the chance to be mentored by me, check out PublishersEmpire.com and sign up to be notified when we launch. That's www.publishersempire.com. I hope to see you there. As always, this is Tom Morcus. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Thank you for listening to In the Trenches. Your creative work doesn't stop here. Join the resistance, the small but growing army of entrepreneurs and artists putting a dent in the world at www.tommorcus.com. Never fight alone. Join the resistance.